It's a hiker's worst nightmare. I couldn't find my own footprints and I couldn't find a trail. Lost in the blazing heat of a desert wilderness, his food runs out. I figured it was going to be a short hike. Then his water. We lived for about three days without water. Five days in a living hell. Nobody knows where I am. Barely clinging to life. I was preparing for my own funeral. When is that point when they're looking for a body? In his sweltering fight to survive. In the wild, when things go bad, they go bad fast. Without warning, your life can hang by a thread. Adventurer and survivor Craig DiMartino fought back from his own wilderness disaster to reclaim his life. Now Craig meets other courageous outdoorsmen who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. Hi, I'm Craig DiMartino. A lot of us have rituals, things we do or say to clear our heads and get us ready for the next adventure. For me, it's packing and sorting the gear for the next trip. After closing a big real estate deal, Ed Rosenthal liked to go for a hike to clear his head. He was an experienced hiker and he chose a familiar trail here in Joshua Tree National Park. But even experienced hikers get turned around, sometimes even lost. Surviving for days under the scorching sun with no water or food would take a miracle. One fueled by faith and Ed's incredible will to live. Joshua Tree National Park in Southern California is one of the most unique parks in the U.S. Here, two deserts meet, creating an arid landscape dotted with plants that long ago adapted to this rugged terrain. With over 550,000 acres of wilderness, hikers like Ed Rosenthal return again and again. For me, it's the desert. This time, with Craig DiMartino. After a big real estate deal, you come out here. Is it the contrast of those two worlds? Like, tell me about that. Commercial real estate is very competitive. Mm -hmm. So there's the fact of relaxing after the deal. Ed's wife is never surprised by these trips. It was like his way to celebrate, and I always knew to stay away from him. It was like, don't ask him any questions. You know he's going to go somewhere. He's going to do a hike. And I go away, and my wife will know where I'm staying, but she may not know anything about the hike or where I'm going. Ed's plan was to hike a trail he had done before. It started at Black Rock Canyon Campground and went up to Warren Peak, five and a half miles round trip. I had done this hike 12 to 15 times before. I no longer used a map or a compass going on the trail because I had it memorized, or so I thought. I had asked a guy where was a good place to park near the trailhead. Right over there. Thanks. I pulled in and parked. I figured it was going to be a short hike. I didn't take extra water. I didn't take a long shirt or long pants. When Ed got to the trailhead, there was a coyote on it. Neither made a move at first. In retrospect, I think that coyote was a warning that I shouldn't go on the trail that day. But Ed didn't heed the warning, nor was he concerned about September desert temperatures that could easily reach 100 degrees during the day and drop at night. He was, after all, only hiking for a few hours. With a packed lunch and a few essential wilderness items in his backpack, Ed took off. The hike was fantastic. I felt great. The view from Warren Peak you see all the way across to Palm Springs, and it's just awesome. After savoring the view and his lunch, Ed started back down the trail around 2 o'clock. I saw I couldn't find my own footprints, and I couldn't find a trail. I kept looking around the hillside for a way down and found nothing. Ed crisscrossed the top of the hill, but still couldn't find his footprints. That looks good. Finally, he thought he spotted a trail below. And it must be headed toward the parking lot. And I jumped down. And that was the fateful decision. 
I looked back up and saw, I can't get back up. There was only one direction to go. So Ed followed what he thought was a real trail. He didn't recognize it as a dry waterfall bed. As I kept going down, all of a sudden I found myself on a steep incline and really felt like I'm in the wilderness. I shouldn't be there. Now he was really worried. He had been hiking for hours in the hot desert heat, and the afternoon was quickly slipping away. And then I saw there was no trail, and I was looking down into a chasm, into a series of landings that had no end. He decided to call for help, but his cell phone had no reception. Again, he had no choice. He had to turn around and go back up the hill. I pounded into the hillside the name of my boss that I was angry at, at my old firm. Damn it, damn it. And I cursed him as I climbed up the hill. By the end of the day, Ed came to the worst possible conclusion. I'll never forget, I looked out at the vista of the desert. Oh my God, I'm headed into the Sonoran Desert, the hotter desert, and I'm going in the completely wrong direction. I was lost, and I knew no one would know about it. Ed Rosenthal had gone for a day hike in Joshua Tree National Park. But he lost his way in the dry, hot terrain. And by nightfall, he was out of water. It started to get dark, and I found a comfortable little canyon. I didn't think anyone was looking for me at that point, but still, I took my emergency blanket out, and I started signaling with my headlamp. Exhausted from the heat and hiking, Ed gave up signaling and fell asleep. When he woke early the next morning, he tried to eat some dates, but his mouth was so dry, he couldn't chew. I tried to drink my urine in a cup I had with me, and I got it in my mouth, it made me nauseous. I spit it out and said, oh, I'd rather be dead. Ed dug deep and found the strength to keep walking. He ended up in a canyon he named Purple Canyon, where he came to a very important realization. When I turned into this canyon along the way, it felt really good to just feel like a little child and something bigger was guiding you along. Even though you're not in control of it. If I kept fighting every minute, I never would have made it out of there. I would have had a heart attack. As the day heated up into the high 90s, dehydration began to really take its toll on his body. That was the day that broke the heat record in Los Angeles. And I'm out on the desert, and I realize no one could survive this heat. Desperate to get out of the sun, he spotted the only shade, a juniper tree. You're having dreams, and you were dreaming that you're in your regular life. And then you'd feel the sun burn your legs and you'd wake up and you'd be in this, this hell on earth. For me, that would just be, that would be soul crushing. Fortunately, I was exhausted. And every time I woke up, I moved closer into the shade and fell asleep again. At different times during the day, Ed would hallucinate, thinking he heard a horse or saw a car. He would blow his whistle to get their attention. Oh. He tried to cut into a yucca tree, hoping to get some moisture from it. He 
didn't succeed. As the day turned into night, this canyon got very cold. I wrapped myself in the emergency blanket and I tried to sleep on my backpack. It felt like a blue chill was over the whole canyon and I couldn't sleep at all. By Sunday, Ed had been without food and water for nearly two days with temperatures in the 90s. If he was to stay alive, he knew he had to find better shelter from the sun. There was a split rock I found, and I literally went and hid inside this rock and fell asleep. And finally, the sun came and hit me in my face, and I knew I'd broil under that rock. And I said to myself, oh my God, I don't know what the hell's gonna happen here. A hiker's worst nightmare, getting lost in a desert with no cell signal on the hottest day on record. I'm out in this canyon. I better communicate to my wife and daughter and I had a pen with me, so I started writing on my hat. The need to communicate with loved ones was just as strong with Craig after his accident. The one guiding force for me was getting back to my family, to be a dad again, to be a husband again. Is that what led you to write on the hat? I realized the seriousness of the situation. I have to tell them what they should do and how much I love them. What were some of the things you wrote? Dear Nicole and Hillary, I love both of you. I made a wrong turn. I may not make it out of here. It's like your last will and testament. It became my will, and I started to give instructions for exactly how to handle my death. While Ed was writing to his loved ones in despair, he had no idea he had been reported missing to park rangers. So you said the car's been here since Friday? Yes, it has. The investigation started with a camper who had made contact with Ed on Friday. Yeah, the first time I saw him was when he pulled up here asking for directions. And had also seen his vehicle there on Sunday and had never seen him again. Hello. It's a call no wife would ever want to receive. A park ranger reporting that her husband was missing. No, I haven't heard anything. It was a bad dream. You always hear about it, that it happens to somebody else, getting that type of phone call, and it was like, no, this isn't happening. After ruling out suicide and checking hospitals for injured hikers, a search and rescue operation was launched, both from the air and ground. The search was led by the National Park Service and grew to include multiple county search and rescue teams and many volunteers. Let's move out. Up to 60 rescuers a day started looking for Ed. You're gonna do a search of the area. If we can find a track. Is there any evidence of where this person was or a direction of travel? And if you're not having any luck, then you quadrant off sections and we start doing a grid search in those areas. Hey, this is command post. This is 9R66 Moeller. Robert Moeller was one of the volunteers. You can live for about three days without water, but you can live for uh, three weeks without food. So the number one element being lost really is water. By Sunday, Ed had been out of water for three days. But Deputy Brown knew the outcome of this search could not be predicted. Depends on their will to survive, their capability, how healthy they are. Every person is different, so I never underestimate what someone is capable of doing. Ed Rosenthal was in and bought a pair of hiking boots. Ed's wife did what she could to help. 
I knew the kind of boots that Ed wore. I knew that he always purchased them at one store. And so I called that store and I told them what had happened. I have a photo of him wearing the boots. They contacted the manufacturer. They were able to get the print from the bottom of the boot, which they then faxed directly to the ranger so they knew what they were looking for in terms of, you know, Ed's boots. But they didn't find Ed on Sunday or Monday. On Tuesday, the weather broke and cloud cover cooled down the temperatures enough for Ed to feel he could make another move. I saw a lot of grass clumps available there that I could burn. And I used the end of these fire starters and I lit up this wall of plants and the flames went pretty high. The fire burned for like five, 10 minutes and then it went down. Well, that's the end of my fire starters. I wasn't sure if anyone had seen it. In fact, no one saw his flames. He would have to try to survive one more night, his fifth, cold and alone, with his body slowly shutting down. Ed Rosenthal had survived for four days without water. Search and rescue teams had been looking for him for three. Time was definitely running out. I kept thinking to myself, when is that point where they make that decision to stop searching for a person and then they're looking for a body? On Tuesday, Deputy Brown, frustrated with the lack of results so far, decided with her sergeant and a volunteer to start their own search for Ed. Yeah, there he is. This wasn't protocol something they felt compelled to do. We went to the location where the vehicle had last been. We picked up track. Kind of going off in that direction. And we began searching. They were dogged. We continued on the panorama loop, ended up finding he had gone off the loop. He came right here. And started a downward descent. He came way out here. Wow. We found almost every single track from there. That's him. Because it's not a hike area. They followed Ed's tracks all night, putting their own lives at risk. By then, they were completely exhausted and out of water. We have coordinates on Rosenthal's last footprint. They had to call it quits and called in their GPS coordinates. Forty King is on their way. I'm ready for a helicopter ride. You and me both. I was exhausted and tired. I was told to go home and sleep. The search continued based on their last coordinates in the air and on the ground. Ed, now extremely weak from dehydration and heat stroke, could barely move. His organs were beginning to shut down. I found myself starting to leave all my possessions around me in a circle, almost like I was preparing for my own funeral. And I stayed inside that circle most of the day. Thursday morning was the only morning I didn't wake up. I was gone. Hello, Mrs. Rosenthal. I want you to know that we've been searching for your husband day and night. We have I felt like this was going to be the last day. Excellent trackers searching for your husband. I know working in the medical field, to be without food and water for that many days is pretty impossible. Either there would be good news or there wouldn't be good news. I heard a helicopter. And I opened my eyes and saw the metal of a helicopter right there in the canyon. I heard a guy say, hey, are you that Rosenthal that's out here? Like I'm gonna say, oh no, he's over in the next suite. And I said, yes. He said, can you get up? And I got up 
and I flopped over. The head ranger walked in. We found him. We found your husband. Oh. I said to her, wait, is he alive? Yes, your husband is one tough guy. You're thank welcome. you, thank you. It was really, really incredible. Ed was found outside the formal search grid because Deputy Brown's team's efforts pointed to a different direction. He had circled around for miles in the days he tried to find his way out. He was found eight miles from where he left the trail, having descended 2,000 feet. If Ed hadn't been rescued that morning, in all probability, he would have died that day. They did find some heart damage, but I was very fortunate. I understand you're supposed to be dead if you're without water for six days. Ed, grateful to be alive, thought the best way to say thanks to everyone was to throw a party. We invited everybody from the search and rescue and all the people from the park service and it was fabulous to see these people again and having it be under joyous circumstances. Ed believes there are lessons to share from his experience. He wrote a book, The Desert Hat, Survival Poems, that recalls his harrowing time in the desert. For you, you're this high-powered real estate guy, and now you're in this situation where you're this little thing. It's emotionally draining, it, it can crush you. And I tell people, even though I went through all of that, I wouldn't change it. The reason I feel I would never do anything different I left the big shot and harder parts of my personality on the floor of that canyon, and I don't want them back. When Ed realized he was in trouble, he stayed calm and took logical steps to help find his way out. Like Ed, I know the will to live and return to one's family can be a powerful force. Sometimes, visions of your own death can help keep you going and become one of the biggest survival assets in any fight to survive.